Hey, what's going on, everybody? Nathan Holmes here, Senior Minister of Hamilton Mill Christian Church. I am so blessed and excited that you're online checking out some of the content that we've made available to you. And I hope that it's a blessing to you and helps you to grow in your walk with Christ. Just know that this content is only meant to supplement your growth and not replace your involvement in a strong Bible-based church. It's one thing to watch church online, but it's a whole other thing to be a part of a life-giving church that's on the front lines of doing ministry in the lives of the community and its people. So I'd love for you to come out and join us one Sunday and be a part of what we're doing here at Hamilton Mill Christian Church because I believe that God is doing something great in the lives of the people that are here week in and week out. So thanks and have a great one. Everybody good? Everybody good? Hey, I'm glad you guys are here. Uh, It's a wonderful morning so far, and I'm just really thankful and honored that you've chosen to be with us today and worship uh, and just hang out with us. It's been a wonderful morning. Hey, uh, my name is Nathan. For those of you new in the room, just here for the first time, just want to say hello to you. I've met a couple this morning already, but... Uh, and we've, we have some special visitors maybe joining us online from Lilburn Christian Church, so I want to say hi to you guys uh, this morning as well. Uh, this morning, as Josh already said, we are kicking off a series that uh, has been delayed a little bit, but I am so excited to start this with you guys and uh, really launch us into the next part of our time together for the next five weeks. We're going to be talking about this idea of habits and what that looks like. So um, I really want to encourage you to be with us each and every week if you can. If you can just be here, check us out online, follow along, make sure you're tuning in because there's some special things that I think will happen as a result of us taking time as a church body to really study and dwell on this idea of habits and what that looks like. And we'll kind of flesh that out as we get going. So uh, there's some handouts for you. Make sure you get those. Make sure you get your app fired up. We'll just be in two books today, John and Romans. Uh, I went easy on you this morning, kind of easy, uh, easy flip work for you. Uh, the key question I really just want to get to this morning for you guys and for myself is just this. What is standing between you and a closer walk with Christ? What is it that is standing in the way of you walking and abiding more with Christ? You know, we talked about that idea of abiding with Christ in November. What is standing in the way of that? And I hope through today's message and then what we kind of lay out over the next several weeks, uh, we are challenged, we are um, provoked into uh, further action and taking ownership of our spiritual walk with our Heavenly Father and with Jesus Christ. So with that, we're going to open in prayer and get started because we have a lot to get to this morning. So let's do that. Father God, we come to you this morning just so thankful and blessed to be in this place today. Father, we thank you for just the the many blessings that we have that we take for granted so many times. And so, Father, right now, we just ask that in this time of teaching, you would come amongst us, that you would open our minds and our hearts to what you would have to say through the reading of your word and just our yielded heart to you. Father, you you know us. And so, so I just ask that you would divide this message amongst us in this room today, that as we leave this place, we have no doubt in our minds that you were speaking directly to us about a very specific thing in our life. So Father, we love you so much, and we thank you for your son, Jesus, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. I love the analogy that we saw in that little video that we opened up this morning with. This idea that uh, if you were to take that small domino at the very beginning and place that up against that large slab that was at the end and gave it a little thrust of wind, and it fell and it hit that large slab nothing would happen, right? Like the large slab would just be like, serious? What's, what's going on here, right? But I love the way the physics work in this, that as you begin something small and it builds and it gradually grows bigger and bigger, that that little tiny action that started at the beginning can make a giant impact down the line. And that's exactly what we're talking about over the course of these several weeks is this idea, you can write this down if you want, it's your very first thing right off the bat, is that small changes can make a big impact over time. Or if you want to say it a different way, small changes over time make a big impact. I don't know however you want to do that. But when we begin to make small changes in our life, it, it can have a big impact down the road. And we've seen this in a lot of negative ways in our life, right? Something small creeps in, some kind of habit creeps in, something small and seemingly insignificant, a relationship, um, a, a, a curiosity, uh, different things can creep in. And next thing you know, those habits can turn to addictions and addictions can then wreck lives. Let me ask you a question. What if you could reverse engineer your life? Like, what if you could look at the end and go, this is what I want it to look like, this is what I want it to be, 
And then begin to build into your life different aspects and different habits and different practices that would lead you to that point, right? Like you would be very intentional about this instead of just kind of running on autopilot, instead of just running on cruise control. I'm not saying that there's anything necessarily wrong with cruise control or autopilot, but I'm saying for a Christ follower, that can be a little dangerous. It can just be a little bit dangerous. Nothing good really happens from running on autopilot. Nothing good really happens from just being on cruise control in your life. Think about, think about relation in terms of your job. If you were to just show up at work and you didn't really apply any effort, you didn't really do anything crazy or, or you didn't really try to advance anything, you just kind of just cruised along, right? Most of your employers would not be so keen on that idea. I mean, they, they may keep you on, like you might be the, the guy that's always there, but you certainly wouldn't get promoted. You certainly wouldn't climb the corporate ladder, so to speak. You certainly wouldn't gain the respect of your coworkers or your boss or anybody that works with you or for you or under you or around you. You would just be seen as the guy that's paid uselessly for not really having any point of being there, right? What about, what about in your parenting? What if, what if you never cared about, you know, you're just being really intentional with your kids. You just were on autopilot the entire time, just leaving it up to chance that hoping, hoping they'll turn out okay. Or in your marriage, you you just say, you know, I'm not going to put any effort in. I'm just going to kind of be on autopilot, on cruise control. How would that work? I I would say that autopilot really is only good for for just just planes, right? I I guess Chad Ulrey or like the Spearbacks could get away with with doing autopilot in their job because they're they're pilots. So that's, I guess, an okay thing. But, But it's even still like you want somebody skilled behind the the stick, right? You want somebody skilled behind the yoke of that plane that can take over in a a moment's notice. So I would even say then it's not the greatest. So I want you to do me a favor. Turn to a neighbor and tell them, just say no to autopilot. Tell them that this morning. Say no to autopilot. There you go. (laughs) So here's why. I want to look at a passage that many of us have read before. Many of us know this. Many of us probably um, really overemphasize the latter part of this passage. And we kind of gloss over this first part, but I want us to look at John 10, 10, where Jesus says this, the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. Now we read that last part and we're like, yes, that's what I want. That's, that's exactly what I want, Jesus. Thank you for that gift. Thank you for that sacrifice. I will gladly accept your offer. However, we forget the very beginning sentence. The thief's purpose, the enemy's purpose, is to steal and to kill and destroy. This tells us very clearly that there is an enemy that exists in a spiritual dimension that is after you. We've said this before in this teaching time. This this enemy is intentionally out to destroy you. And I need to tell you something, and this is the big question you need to consider for yourself. Write this down. The enemy most definitely has a plan. The question is, do you? Do you have a plan? Because the enemy knows your, your sin. He knows your, your proclivity to a certain temptation. He knows what thing to dangle in front of you that you typically have bit before. He knows exactly what you will, are susceptible to because he's watched you, he's studied you, he's known you since you were a child. And he knows exactly what it takes to get you entailed in the next temptation, the next sin, the next trap. He knows you. He knows your husbands. He knows your wives. He knows your kids. He has a plan to destroy you. He has a plan to destroy your marriage. He has a plan to destroy your parenting, your kids, and your very life. (laughs) Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? (laughs) Here's what I want you to understand. Here's what I want you to understand. Write this down. This is the sermon in the sentence. If you don't get anything else, this is really kind of a a big thrust for this morning. If you're not living intentionally, if you're not living with the end in mind, with the end, end result of what you want in mind, if you're not living intentionally, then you will never be prepared for the attack from the enemy. The unprepared life, the unintentional life never considers the fact that the enemy is out to get you. Never considers the fact that this temptation that you're facing is not circumstance, it's not just just a happenstance, it's a deliberate, intentional act on the enemy to destroy your life. We read about this in Paul's writings, we talk about the armor of God. We read about this in, in the words of Jesus. 
It's all over the pages of Scripture. You and I have an enemy that's after our souls and our hearts and our lives. Now, I said at the very beginning that we need to plan with the end in mind, kind of reverse engineer this thing and, and work it backwards. This works in parenting. You, you define what you want in your kids' life. This works in marriages. It works um, in your spiritual lives as well. And if we're not careful, if we're not intentional about this, we can fall susceptible to the attack of Satan. And so this series and this morning, I really want to begin to lay out this idea of how this works, because really, believe it or not, you're kind of already on autopilot now. And, and let me explain it. The best way to probably explain this um, is, with, is with this bell. Now, back in 1904, a Russian um, physiologist by the name of Ivan, uh, Ivan Pavlov, I mean, you know if this is uh, Pavlov's bell or Pavlov's dog, uh, did an experiment where he would ring a bell before he fed these dogs. And over time, what happened was at the ringing of the bell, the dogs began to salivate and, and they, they, they came running because they knew exactly what that meant. It meant that there was food and they were gonna get fed, right? Some of you are like, I don't know that experiment. Maybe, let me put it this way, uh, Dwight also fell susceptible to this with some mints, some Altoid mints on the office. So if you watch the office in its heyday, uh, Dwight also got hooked on this with Altoid mints. So there you go. Um, but did you know that you're wired that way too? You're wired just like that. Maybe not with a bell. Okay, we're not gonna, I hope nobody started to like salivate in here when I did that. If so, we'll talk to me after, we'll, we'll get you some help. Um, but we do that all the time. We, we fall prey to this, we fall victim to this all the time, and we don't even know it because this is just so, such a part of our DNA and just our everyday life that this very act, some of these things are very much an on autopilot for us. We're just on cruise control. Let me show you how this works. It all begins with a trigger, right? It all starts with a trigger. There's something that triggers you. Let's say hunger pains. That's one I get uh, quite often. No judgment from you guys, please. Thank you very much. But I do get hunger pains quite a bit. I get hungry quite often. I also suffer from a thing called hangriness. Anybody know what that is? Where you get, hang you get angry and you're hungry at the same time and it's never good. Um, unfortunately, the Bible doesn't speak to that and it's really hard to find self-help articles on that. But it's a, it's a real deal. The struggle's real. So you have the hunger pain, which leads to a trigger, or that's a trigger, which leads to a routine. That routine is you're going to eat something, right? You're going you're to take some food in, put some calories down your throat, right? You're going to take in something to give you some nourishment, right? And then you'll have the reward. And the reward is you don't feel hungry anymore, right? You, you, feel fine, you can carry on about your day, you're no longer hangry, in my case, right? Oh, this happens to other stuff too. You feel thirsty, that's your trigger. Uh, the routine is you get something to drink, right? And then the reward is like you don't die, right? Because we all need water to survive. We all need nourishment. Um, what about when you're tired? You feel tired, that's your trigger. Uh, the routine is you know you have to get something, get some rest, so you get some rest. And the reward is like you feel better, you feel more well rested, you feel ready to go, right? You, you wake up in the morning, the trigger is you, you wake up in the morning and you have that really awful taste in your mouth, like you like, was making out with a bear the night before or something, I don't know. <laughs> like you just have that really awful taste in your mouth, which leads to a routine of brushing your teeth, and the reward is people will talk to you that day because they they're not offended by your bad breath, right? Like that's, that's, the, that's the thing we go through. That's the autopilot that we exist on. Every single day we make thousands of decisions based on this little loop right here. Now, this also applies to some less flattering things. You feel lonely, that's the trigger. You get into a routine where you act out in relationships, that's the routine. Then the reward is you feel temporarily fulfilled. You, you, another trigger would be you feel insignificant. You, you feel as though you're not seen or something, and so the, that's the trigger and that which, which goes to a routine of gossip, maybe. You have some news and you get to share it, and, that makes you feel very needed, so that's the reward. And then maybe you've felt angry before, and anger leads to a routine of yelling and lashing out, which then feeds a reward of, of being heard. Here, here's the thing, when we complete this loop, the reward always reinforces the routine from that trigger. When that reward is experienced, when we feel that rush of dopamine or, or chemical reaction in our brains that said, this is good, this is, this is good for me, I feel better as a result of this routine, it only reinforces that routine from that trigger. 
So if you and I are going to do anything about this autopilot nature that we have, we have to understand this loop and begin to address the aspects of this. Because if you continue on the way you're doing it and never define this, never take time to identify these things and analyze this, you're just setting yourself up for a lifetime of failure and and just really regret and hurt and frustration. You know, Paul talked about this in Romans 7, uh, verse 15. I love this passage. This, This actually kicks off a really fabulous passage. If you're in small groups, you're going to be reading the rest of this today. But it says this in verse 15, he says, I, I don't really understand myself. Can I get an amen in the room this morning? I don't really understand myself. For I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. Does anybody identify with that this morning? If we could just be honest with ourselves and just kind of strip away the church facade this morning, does anybody in the room just go, I get that. Like That resonates with me. That the things that I detest the most, I somehow fall back into that habit. I somehow fall back into that loop. And Paul just, just so bluntly and just blatantly and honestly just lays this out for us. And he says this, right? So it's like, I mean, if Paul says this, I feel like there's some comfort here that we can like, kind of like come together with each other and with Paul and be like, okay, let's, let's problem solve this. Let's get this figured out. If we're not liking the outcomes of our life, we have to kind of dial things back and look at the pattern that we exist in. Thomas Merton, uh, he, he says this. He said, ask me not where I live and what I like to eat. Ask me what I am living for and what I think is keeping me from living fully for that. You know, I think a lot of us could look at our lives and go, you know, I want to live fully for the Lord. I, I want to live fully for, for the kingdom and, and, and promoting God's kingdom here on this in this place, in my work, in my home, in my, in, in my, you know, my career, in my hobbies. But, but so many times there's things that stand in the way of that. There's things that just kind of get in the way. So here's what you have to do. Write this down. You must rework the routine by redefining the reward. When you, when you redefine the reward, you can rework the routine that will help you succeed in this. This goes back to the reverse engineering. This is all this is. This is looking at the end result and saying, what do I want from my life? What do I want from this thing? What do I want from this aspect of my life? And then how do I get there with the steps needed to take? With your marriage, you can look at this and say, I I want the reward to be a rock solid marriage, right? I don't just want to coast along. I don't want to just, just have the easy way. I want to have a rock solid marriage. Okay, so that means the new routine means uh, maybe you, you put the phone or the iPad or the tablet or the computer or the work or the whatever it is, you put it down. You spend more in time attentionally with that person. You prioritize the other person. You communicate better. You make all forms of intimacy a, a, a priority in your life and in your marriage. What about with your kids? You, you say, okay, I don't, I don't want to just raise like good ball players, right, that get a college scholarship and then blow out their knee and, and never go any further or just good little citizens that just go and do a job the rest of their life. I, I want to raise kids that are devoted followers of Christ and are, are just really dedicated and capable individuals in the kingdom. So that means you have to do some things different. You have to engineer your intentionality. You have to say, I'm going to make a consistent investment of quality time with my kids, where I, I sit down and I talk about the hard topics. I, I discuss things that are going on in their life. We, we converse and we relate on different things. I'm not their best friend, but I'm a friend in a time of need for them. You, you look at their, the time and the influence you have and you, you, you focus more on their heart and less on their actions. And you, you focus on their love for Jesus and you foster and develop that. Right? It, it changes things. When you, when you redefine the reward, it allows you to see more clearly what the routine needs to be. And I think that the same thing applies for our spiritual lives as well. If we want a more dedicated spiritual life, we have to make a change in the routine that we have every single day. You can't just say, I want a different spiritual end, a different spiritual life as an end result, and never make a change. You can't do that. That's the definition of insanity. So this is what happens. It's it's kind of a a neat formula that I want to give you this. It's really simple. When you have a known trigger... 
plus the experience of the reward. This is where you get to experience the payoff, the, the, the great thing that happened as a result of this change in routine. So this is a, a prolonged experience of this. Over time, it leads to a change routine. When, when, you, when you have that trigger and you think about the reward, you think about the thing that's coming at the end of that, when you make that decision over and over again, over time, consistently again and again and again, it results in a change routine. A lot of, a lot of counselors and, and psychologists will tell you if you're, if you're battling some sort of an addiction, one of the best things that you can do is keep a journal. Keep a journal. It's, the guys in the room, I know this is like, what are you talking about, Nathan? Okay. But seriously, follow me. Keep a journal and you dialogue about your emotions while you're going through the struggles of that addiction. So when you, when you fail in your addiction, you write how you feel. Most of the time, it's, I feel awful as a result of this addiction and, and falling to this temptation. I, I feel awful. I, I, feel, I feel dirty. I feel, um, I, you know, I feel like I wasn't strong enough, right? You write these emotions down. And then on the days that you're victorious over a temptation, you write down those feelings as well. You, you write those out in that same journal. And what your mind begins to do, it begins to associate the positive feelings of the, of the good over the negative feelings of the bad, and your brain begins to make these magical connections, right? God designed our brain so amazingly, and we begin to rewire and restructure the way our brain thinks about different activities and habits that we have in our life. So it's that formula that, that, that over time, this experience of a reward, this experience of a healthy outcome, over time, a prolonged period of time, consistently over and over again, leads to a change routine leads to a change in how we do this. So the best way for us to do this is through a little word called disciplines. <laughs> now I know when I say that word, most of us default to a negative connotation to what comes to mind with disciplines. I get this. We usually go back to something along the lines of something bad, something less pleasing in our life, something that is a consequence or maybe a punishment, or at the very least, it's a, a forced effort to do something, right? It's not a pleasant thing when we think of discipline. And I understand that. But you know, if you were to throw in the aspect of spiritual into this now, where we're talking about spiritual disciplines, um, it doesn't get any better because most of us just go, great, now I just feel guilty for thinking those thoughts about something spiritual. Thanks, Nathan, I really appreciate that. So, but see, a lot of times we focus on the first definition that's, that's of this disciplines, which is this, let's throw this up here, uh, the, the practice of training people to obey rules or a code of behavior. See, that's very, uh, that's gross. Uh, using punishment to correct disobedience. That's what we think of when we think of uh, discipline, right? But there's a second part of that definition that I think is far more applicable to us. It says a branch of knowledge, typically one studied in higher education. It, it's a discipline. You go into a discipline. You, you start studying a discipline, and it begins to help you understand that whole sphere of what that topic or what that piece is. What if we could look at it more in the lines of the second definition? What if we could look at spiritual disciplines as the, that, that, that behavior or that branch of knowledge is, is the heart of our Heavenly Father? With walking with our Savior Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit, what if we could reframe the question and the discussion under those terms where we're not looking at this as something that's negative, a form of punishment to manipulate behavior, right? That just, that doesn't sound right. That's not what the thrust of spiritual disciplines is about. I want to, I want to give you an alternative here. Write this down. Spiritual disciplines augment our spiritual growth and enable us to grow to maturity and grow closer to Jesus. If you, could, if you could think of it in those terms, where we are using spiritual disciplines, various disciplines, to be able to help us along the way, to grow closer in our walk with Jesus Christ, to augment that, that spiritual growth towards spiritual maturity. And it changes the way we think about this. It changes the way we, we focus on this. I read it this way this, this past week. Actually, this was better part of a month ago now. But it says this, Spiritual disciplines are habits, practices, and experiences that are designed to develop, grow, and strengthen certain qualities of your spiritual life, to build the muscles of one's character and expand the breadth of one's inner life. They structure the workouts which train the soul. 
I love the way that author puts that. That they, they structure the workouts that train the soul, that, that stretch that muscle of our inner spirit, that muscle that connects us to our Heavenly Father. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to challenge you over the next few weeks to be with us as we go through these aspects of spiritual disciplines. We've got a couple weeks of, of housekeeping to take care of because I get this all the time when we get into this topic of spiritual, spiritual disciplines about what they are and what they aren't and what their intended purpose is and what the intended purpose is not. So we're gonna take care of some of that next week and the week after and then we're gonna talk about the spiritual disciplines that flow out of the pages of scripture that we see and how you and I can begin to, to work out that, that spiritual muscle with just some simple changes, some really small changes in our life that I believe, I truly believe, I believe this because I've experienced it myself. Those small little changes in your habit will lead to a large, large impact in your overall life. So we all go on this journey together, right? We all say, yes, we're going to do this together. And, and my life begins to have small changes with big impacts down the road. And, and your life begins to have small changes with impacts down the road. And your life, and your life, and your life. It's, I feel like Oprah. Uh, you, you get a change. You get a change. You get a change. Um, what does that do to our church? What does that do to our community? What does that do to your families? What does that do to your jobs, your professions, your careers, your hobbies? You see how important this little thing is? You see how important that little tiny domino now has become? It's not just a discipline where it's trying to manipulate my behavior. No, this is a, a pathway that leads us closer to the heart of our Heavenly Father, that leads us into a, a tighter relationship with our Savior Jesus, which puts us more in tune, more in tune with the leading of the Holy Spirit in our own life, in this church, in our community, in every environment that you and I find ourselves in. So I just want to challenge you this morning, commit to be with us in the weeks ahead. Commit to be with us in the weeks ahead because I feel like this series, this topic can drastically change the, the, the trajectory of our life if we allow it. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful and, and just blessed that, um, that you invite us into this kind of relationship with you, that you have said to us, we're not cut off from you, Father, but we have access to who you are. And as we go through this, Father, I just pray that that invitation uh, would just be so loud and clear, that we would feel your welcome embrace, that we would feel your, your loving call to our lives to just abide with you and walk with you in everything that we do. Father, may we be challenged, may we, may we leave this place with a new sense of devotion and dedication to you. God, we uh, give you this time of decision and we ask that you would be with us in everything that's done now in the next few moments. It's your son's name we pray. Amen. So uh, I, I want to ask you a question that um, we're going to probably use quite a bit. You know, when we talk about our daily life, your undisciplined life maybe, I want to ask you how how's your walk with Christ right now you know when we we read the pages of scripture where Jesus tells us to take up our cross and follow him uh, a lot of us in this day and age we kind of take that as you know we have a cross to bear something some ailment some affliction something that we we just have to carry right that's that's how we've taken that verse and that's so far off from what was intended in the first century in the days of Jesus that term, take up your cross, would have been so offensive because there's never been a, a, a capital punishment device more gruesome and just vile than the Roman cross. And so that phrase really in the intended purpose and really for us today should be a call to die to ourselves, to die to our own wants and desires and to pursue a life chasing after Jesus Christ means we put our wants and desires to the side and we place his at the top most priority in our life. So I just want to ask you, how's your cross walk? How, how is your walk carrying that cross following after Jesus Christ? You know, we, we intentionally create this time of 
decision and just spiritual direction for you. This isn't a pause in the service so that we can, you know, get ready for communion or, or something like that. This is intended to allow each and every one of us, from the most prideful of us to the most humble of us, to honestly consider how we are doing in our walk with our Heavenly Father and with our Savior, Jesus Christ. Because I'm going to tell you right now, until we breathe our last and we close our eyes to this life and open our eyes to eternity, none of us are perfect in that realm. So there's always a step. There's always something we can do that's going to challenge us a little bit further. That's going to push us a little bit harder to follow him. So this is what this time is intended for. How is your walk carrying that cross, following after Christ, dying to self, living for kingdom life? If you're struggling in your life right now with that, we have our elders in the back, a couple staff in the back. I would love at any point over this next song and communion and offering, or even after the service, if you just want to sit and pray with somebody, have somebody pray over you, you don't have to divulge any information. You can just say, I just need prayer. And who doesn't need that? Amen. (laughs) But this is a time that we have intentionally set aside so that you can have a moment to consider your life. If you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I just want to tell you there's no greater decision than to make that a priority in your life right now. I'll be down front. If you're ready to make that decision now, you can come see me. We'll make that happen today. If you have questions about that, there's a spot in our bulletin. You can check the box. Someone will get in touch with you this week, tomorrow even, and talk with you about what it means to follow Christ. Talk with you what it means to pursue a life chasing after Jesus. I'm going to invite you to stand. We're going to sing and take communion together, give of our tithes and our offerings. If you have a decision to make, if you have prayer, do that now.